you can have healthy behaviors without a focus on weight loss. You can have a healthy body without a focus on weight loss. And in fact, I would say that you actually can't have a healthy body while you are entrenched in diet culture and weight loss culture because you're always going to be striving for thinness at the cost of your own health. Hello, sunshine. Welcome back to another episode of the Neurodivergent Creative Podcast. Today, for our final January 2024 anti-diet New Year's resolutions series, we're going to be talking about problems with medical fat phobia, just general issues within the idealization of thinness and how that is actually harming us. So this starts with anti-fat liberation in the sense that our society sort of dehumanizes fat people. We assume that fat people, and by we, I mean like society, and even fat people ourselves tend to think poorly of ourselves based on these societal decisions and beliefs about fat people. And also Gwen is barking. Gwen hates fat phobia. So thank you, Gwen, for chiming in. We often think that weight loss is a pursuit of health. Realistically, weight loss is a pursuit of thinness, regardless of health, because we don't stop to consider, am I losing weight in a healthy way? Am I doing healthy habits, things that are good for my body as a fat person. And yet I think that I'm not doing enough because I am fat. There's, there's so much involved in it. And the basis of the health at every size community, I don't want to say like program because it's not a program. It's a concept. It's a paradigm. So health at every size, usually abbreviated H-A-E-S or Haze, is about, I mean, it's self-explanatory. It believes that people of any size can be healthy, that health, size is not a factor in health. Size is not a, like, if you are big, you are inherently unhealthy. And if you are small, you are inherently healthy because that's the current paradigm that we operate within, which underdiagnoses thin people because sometimes their symptoms can be overlooked because it's like, oh, well, it doesn't really make sense to test you for diabetes, for example, because you're so thin and so fit. A friend of mine, Sarah, is a type 1 diabetic, diagnosed in her mid-30s, and the doctors were missing it because she was so fit. And because she, like, well, you couldn't possibly have diabetes because of all these factors. And then it's like, but you do the blood work, and it does show these blood sugar issues, the insulin resistance issues, And then you treat for that. And it can also misdiagnose or underdiagnose fat people because when the assumption is that your symptoms will just go away if you lose weight, that means that we're not getting tested for things that would be found earlier in a thinner person. And so health outcomes can actually be worse for fat people, not just because we are fat, but because we don't get tested by the doctors as often as they would test thin people. And there are various studies. Um, I actually, there is an amazing downloadable PDF. It's free. You don't have to have any type of membership or pay anything to access this from the UIC School of Public Health Collaboratory for Health Justice. So it is like a public health issue the way that we talk about and medically support fat people, like the fat population. And this starts with weight bias and weight stigma in health settings and like public health researching. So people who are getting their PhDs, people who are in like research hospitals who are studying the effects of various illnesses and epidemiology and all of this stuff, making sure that there is a more diverse, more body diverse population being studied so that 
fatness, quote unquote, obesity, which is a medicalized term for fatness, isn't just written off as like its own thing. Like, oh, well, they're they're fat, so we don't study them. Like, we need to be studying everybody. Also, the negative impacts of dieting on our like physical health is not something that we tend to talk about. We only tend to talk about dieting as this is good. This is a tool for weight loss. You need to eat less, move more, or eat less, mostly plants, or, you know, these sort of simplified things about how we should be eating to maintain health. And there's a lot to be said for healthy food. Like there are fruits and vegetables and lean meats and whole grains. We know that these are all good for our body. We know that we need different vitamins and minerals and nutrients and we need proteins and fats and carbs. And we know that complex carbs take longer to digest. And we know that we need fiber and that we need a good healthy intake of water to keep all of our cells regenerating to promote and maintain healthy tissues and bones and organs. We know all of this stuff. That's great. But then when we get to a place where we are demonizing types of foods for not being nutritious enough, that's where diet culture starts to get really aggressive because we will just issue completely normal parts of a healthy human diet, like snacks or sweets, like those are normal too. We're allowed to want snacks. Salty things taste good. Sweet things taste good. Crunchy things taste good. Juicy things taste good. And then it's like if we get too much pleasure from them, diet culture says, hey, if you're enjoying the food too much, then you're probably not eating it for the right reasons, which is just to maintain your body. Well, that sounds boring. And like in a world with capitalism and working and student loan debt, like I'm going to eat my vegan ice cream. Okay. And I personally, so we're going to go a little bit into like my own personal experience, which is mine. I can't speak to everybody else's, but after I was in recovery from my eating disorder, I ate a lot more what you would call junk food because I had to basically face my fear that eating a sugary cereal would uh, immediately kill me. I was at a point where I would rather not eat than eat something unhealthy. And I would pack lunches for myself with like baby carrots and almond butter. I don't like raw carrots. I don't like how much you have to chew them. And like, I don't, I do not like the experience of raw, most raw vegetables. I like cooked vegetables. I like roasted carrots. Those are my jam. I will eat roasted carrots with basically any meal. You could offer me breakfast with a side of roasted carrots and I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to eat those carrots. And yet, like, because I prefer them prepared in a certain way, it's like, oh, well, you're not healthy if you want to eat baby carrots. I think that is a false equivalence. Diet culture, mom, we're allowed to have preferences and we're allowed to, you know, some people prefer a raw veg over a cooked veg because of a texture thing, like especially when we're neurodivergent. If you're here on the Neurodivergent Creative Podcast, you definitely know what a texture issue feels like with food. And that's also why neurodivergent children especially will prefer something like a cracker or a cereal over fresh fruits and vegetables because there's there can be so much texture and flavor variety in fresh produce, whereas the cracker or the cereal or the puff is going to be produced at a very consistent texture and flavor. So let's extrapolate that into adulthood where we know that we like certain textures and flavors and then diet culture is like, what? but if you eat that, you're going to be fat and terrible. This is not really helpful. So it actually took me a really long time to get back to fruits and vegetables. Um, I am coming up on five years in eating disorder recovery, and I've always eaten a decent amount of vegetables, but there were some times where like, you know, I would go two or three days without like eating anything green. And I'm like, I know that green vegetables are good for me and have the vitamins and nutrients that I want. And I also knew that like only eating lettuce was probably not giving me the variety. When I started thinking about eating different fruits and vegetables 
to maintain my physical body as opposed to to fuel me and that was all that I got to eat that day. Totally different experience. Diet culture really messes up the mental and emotional relationship that we have with food. So now I'm able to make a smoothie in the morning and it's got berries and it's got kale and it's got bananas and it's got peanut butter. And I know that all of these things are supporting me in different ways. I know that berries are rich in antioxidants and I know that kale has vitamin K and I know that the peanut butter adds some fat so that the fullness from the smoothie lasts longer. The mix of different like macronutrients, and I know macros can be like a triggering word and term because when you're dieting, you might track your macros and that can be just really difficult. And for a while, I couldn't think about it. I couldn't think about, well, how much protein is this versus how much carbs is this versus how much fat is this? because then that would get into tracking and numbers and it would be too much. So I have learned to find ways to feed myself a variety of nutrients without having to log all of my food in a tracking app, which is an eating disorder trigger for me because then I'll start to control it all and it's it's just not a good time. So what I like to do is eat the rainbow. And this is that when I am planning our weekly meals, I try to include at least one red vegetable, orange vegetable, yellow vegetable, green vegetable, and purple vegetable. Uh, Blue vegetables are a bit few and far between, but you could throw some blueberries in there. Um, I'm also trying to eat more fruit. So fruit was really triggering for me for a while because that was like the only sweet thing that I would eat. And so for a few years into my recovery, fruit was just really triggery. It just... I couldn't do it. It felt like I was on a diet just to eat fruit. So consider how entrenched these beliefs must have been for me to not even be able to eat fruit that I like. I love pineapple. I love watermelon. I love strawberries, grapes, clementine oranges. Fruit is so good. And I literally couldn't eat it for probably three years into my diet culture recovery and my eating disorder recovery because it was so just associated in my brain with being on that diet of being like, this is my sweet thing I get to eat today. My half a cup of pineapple, my half a cup of grapes. That's not healthy. So when I try and think how many colors did I eat today? That's a lot more fun. And yeah, I do have to approach it like I'm a toddler sometimes and be like, okay, what did we eat this week? That's red. And I'm like, okay, we had homemade marinara sauce and uh, we had a salad with tomatoes in it. And I made a stuffed pepper out of a red pepper. You know, like what red things did I eat? What orange things did I eat? Well, now I freaking love carrots and we make carrots once a week. So I always have some carrots to eat and sweet potatoes and orange bell peppers. Bell peppers can do a lot. They come in a lot of colors. (laughs) Yellow, like onions, squash. I'm not a big fan of squash, but I did actually get some zucchini this week to try out like a zucchini parmesan type thing. And that was strictly because my store didn't have eggplant. So like trying different preparations of veggies. I used to believe that like if you fried it or if you dipped it in a sauce or if you put salad dressing on it, you somehow negated the health benefits of your vegetables. That is Not true. That is a diet culture myth designed to make you miserable. (laughs) So please eat your veggies in whatever way that you like because they're veggies and they still have vitamins. Okay, great. So vegetable advice aside, um, now I want to get back to the negative effects of dieting and health bias and everything. And where I am sharing this from is a policy brief from... The UIC School of Public Health. So it's called Public Health Needs to Decouple Weight and Health. There's going to be a link to access this paper. Um, It's sort of like a PDF, like write up. So you don't get the full like study, but there's a ton of references uh, to explore if you would like to get into like the scientific paper data. This is sort of a recap of several studies. So the purpose of this brief 
is to recognize examples of weight bias and weight stigma in public health settings, to detail the history and consequence of using BMI and weight as a measure of health, because they are not because of the health at every size approach that has taught us and started to teach medical professionals that healthy outcomes can be had regardless of weight. Purpose number three is to describe the adverse consequences of weight stigma on patients' emotional and physical health. So not only is diet culture harmful mentally and emotionally, diet culture and its effects in the public health settings and like in just your doctor's office can cause not only additional emotional harm, but actual physical, medical negative outcomes. Uh, Develop public health strategies, campaigns, and research design that are free from weight bias and stigma and are inclusive of all body types. So that is sort of the desire of this scientific public health brief is to help the medical industry. It's an industry. It sucks that it's an industry. I don't think medicine should be industrial. But to help the medical industry reduce and eliminate uh, weight bias and stigma and make sure that we are representing diverse bodies in medical research. And this brief also wants to identify strategies to improve accessibility and comfort for patients in larger bodies. So like that starts in the waiting room. You ever notice doctors' waiting rooms tend to have some like double seater chairs that don't have like a bar in the center? That is so fat people can sit there. I love that because let me tell you, having to sit in a waiting room where it's only chairs with like solid metal or plastic arms that dig into you, I have gotten actual bruises on my body. And it is literally dehumanizing to say, well, you deserve that pain because you are fat. Because that's what the arguments come down to. If you're not accommodating people with larger bodies in your public setting or even your private setting, but like if you don't accommodate larger bodies, you're saying larger bodies don't belong here. I don't care if larger bodies hurt themselves to fit in here. I'm not going to cater to them. Okay. That, that says more about you than it says about fat people, in my opinion. So there's that. Okay. So in the past decade... And this is coming from this article. We'll pull it out. It'll look beautiful. Johan, I'll put it up here in a box. Weight discrimination has increased 66% and is one of the only forms of discrimination actively condoned by society. Which means you can discriminate against fat people. You can bully fat people. You can harass fat people. And everybody around you will be like, that is correct. Yes, yes, you should dehumanize the fat people. They are bad. This is a problem because we're still people, you guys. We're still human beings, okay? Fat doesn't take that away. Let's chill out. Decades of research have shown that experiencing weight stigma increases. Okay, so experiencing weight stigma, which just means doctors treat you shitty and people treat you shitty based on your weight, my interpretation. This gets hard, like when you're talking about like medical science and stuff, because I don't want to be flagged as, you know, oh, uh, they said that the science says you're shitty. No, I'm saying that you're shitty. The science says that weight stigma increases the risk of diabetes, heart disease, discrimination, bullying, eating disorders, sedentariness, lifelong discomfort in one's body, and early death. Weight stigma not weight itself, weight stigma, harassment. This is also similar to the statistics around trans people. Like trans people have higher suicide risk. It's not because being trans makes you suicidal. It's because of how people treat trans people. It's because of the discrimination. It's because of the dehumanization. It's hard to exist and be healthy, happy, and joyful in your life when the majority of people around you think that you shouldn't exist. That's harmful. Okay, so then this handout goes into, I keep calling it a handout like I'm in school. This PDF, this report, goes into 11 reasons we should not use weight-based approaches to health. Number one, which is so important to talk about, is that body size, weight stigma, like the focus on body size as a health indicator is actually based in eugenics and racism. So everything was fine. And then Charles Darwin, good old Darwin, good old evolutionary Finch motherfucking Darwin decides that there should be a hierarchy 
of humanity, basically. And this is when whiteness and thinness became goodness and moralness and bestness. And then at the base of this pyramid hierarchy, we have black and brown people who tended to have more body fat and they were seen as less civilized. And when this paradigm started coming in, this is why weight stigma is rooted in anti-blackness and why weight and body liberation must be led by black women primarily because they are the key to this. They are who anti-fatness came from because of black women being shunted to the sidelines of society so that white women could feel safer. Again, that's all me. That part's not in the PDF. You can read the PDF. Sometimes I'm going to go on little tangents. Um, But this is why, like in the last episode, I talked about The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Fantastic work on like a fundamental aspect of the body liberation paradigm. Her work has been absolutely instrumental. And again, Lindo Bacon, who I discussed in last episode as well, the author of Health at Every Size, for all the good that they did in introducing the Health at Every Size paradigm, there's also been a lot of discourse and discussion that they have been building on the work of Black women and probably men too. I don't know, but all I heard about was Black women. So they have been building on a foundation of work done by Black body liberationists without giving due credit. Body liberation is rooted in race liberation. Like all of these intersectional issues are intersectional for a reason. And we cannot, we cannot free fat bodies without also examining the racial element there and freeing fat black bodies as well. Like it's all connected. Okay, great. So number one, the focus on body size as a health marker or a marker of morality is racist and eugenicist. Great. Thumbs up. Okay. The BMI is not a good indicator of health. So it is flawed. And that's what this PDF says is the BMI is flawed. What I will tell you as a human being is that the BMI is basically arbitrary nonsense. So the BMI was developed in the 1830s with the goal of finding the perfect human. And Adolf Ketelet, Ketelet, I don't know, sounds French, sorry. Adolf Q was not a doctor, did not work in the medical field, did not intend for the BMI to be used for medical purposes, but it fit the paradigm, right? Thinness and whiteness at the pinnacle, fatness and blackness as the lowest part of the hierarchy. So BMI supported that. So obviously medicine was like, oh, let's just fold it in. Just fold in the cheese. Shit's Creek reference. Awesome. Okay, great. So BMI then rose in popularity in the 20th century when it was discovered by life insurance companies and used to determine risk of death, basically. Um, But very important to note that the BMI does not consider health behaviors such as stress, nutrition, physical activity, or body composition, such as bone density, muscle density, anything. It just looks at weight and height, the end. And you can't know anything about someone's health or what they look like by weight and height. Like, no, right? Gosh, okay. Um, Point number three in this public health PDF, focusing on weight under diagnosis thin people and misdiagnosis larger people. So nearly half of all overweight individuals studied in this, there's a study between 2005 and 2012 that studied over 40,000 adults in the United States. And their sort of overall health markers were examined relative to their BMI. So BMI has categories of, I think, underweight, normal weight, overweight, obese, and then there's possibly like two more like extremes on either side there. 
but nearly half of overweight individuals, 29% of obese individuals, and 16% of obesity type 2 and 3, okay, there's types, were metabolically healthy, which means that everybody in the comments on Twitter when there's a fat person existing, there's no way that they can know about the health of a fat person by looking at them. Because again, nearly half of overweight individuals are metabolically healthy, which means that any assumptions that you make about whether or not they're metabolically healthy, you got a 50-50 chance of, of a thin person being healthy versus a fat person being healthy. That's a coin toss. Welcome to science. Isn't it great? If extrapolated to the U.S. population, an estimated nearly 75 million U.S. adults, so that's 74,936,678 U.S. adults are misclassified as unhealthy or healthy if based on BMI alone. That's a lot of people. Another analysis of data showed that those in the overweight BMI category actually have the greatest longevity out of any BMI group. Again, contradicting the idea that BMI directly indicates health. Woo! So we should all strive to be overweight. That's my extrapolation. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Point number four is diets don't work and weight loss research is extremely problematic. That extremely is mine. It just says problematic. So short-term weight loss studies indicate that participants lose 5 to 10% of their baseline weight, but long-term studies indicate that regardless of the initial weight loss, most people regain it after two years, with up to two-thirds of dieters likely to regain more weight than they lost on their diets. Ask me how I fucking know, okay? I have lost so much weight on diets and so much weight over exercising. I lost a hundred pounds. And then if we follow this little rebound guy, yeah. And that was, oh, that was a lot of body weight. I'm going to do some quick math. Oh wait, no, I know. I lost 33% of my body weight. I went from 300 pounds to 200 pounds, lost a third of my body weight. And that rebound effect is very real. So I am now over 300 pounds, well over, because of all of this metabolic damage and the rebounding effect of putting your body through a famine so many times. So let's see here. Intentional weight loss has a 90% failure rate. Great. Awesome. If it were any other drug, it would never be considered for use. In addition, much of weight loss data is flawed with many studies featuring high attrition rates, up to 70% that are often not reported, multiple interventions, uh, diet, exercise, smoking cessation, or rigorous and not realistic interventions like Biggest Loser and other reality TV shows that focus on weight. Short study length. Many studies only last six months. There's no way to get a long-term effect data on that. And errors in data analysis. And much of the obesity research in the United States is funded by weight loss and drug companies, thus influencing the types of studies funded and published. Great. Those are four of the 11 reasons from this thing, from this study, or not study, but this roundup as of study. What is that called? I know it has a word. Meta-analysis? Yeah, I think it's a meta-analysis. Okay, great. So from this meta-analysis, those are only four of the points on why weight-based approaches to health are not helpful. So one is the focus on body size is rooted in racism. The BMI is a flawed and non-medical way of measuring human size and health. Focusing on weight misdiagnoses people, underdiagnoses thin people, and misdiagnoses larger people. And diets don't work and weight loss research is often very skewed. So what's the point of dieting when it doesn't work, if not merely in pursuit of thinness, because the research on long-term effects of diets are that dieting is unhealthy and harmful. So just to quickly go down through this, because I have now been talking for like half an hour and I want to wrap this up so you can get back to your day and I don't have to keep thinking about it. Just kidding. It's my whole life. I want to go through the rest of these 11 reasons why weight-based approaches to health are not healthy. Uh, food restriction is harmful has detrimental effects on our physiology, and our bodies, designed to keep us alive at any cost, do not understand the societal importance of dieting. So our bodies interpret 
restriction as starvation, as famine. And so they adapt to keep us from losing the stored fat and energy that our bodies have. Your body is smarter than your diet. Okay, the reason that the diet industry has so much money, and again, this is Caitlin talking, this is not from the PDF. The reason that the diet industry has so much power and money is because they can effectively continue selling you the same thing over and over again for most of your life based on an implication that your morality is lacking if you can't lose the weight. Are we like, why are more people not being like, no, I simply do not ascribe to this? Gross, it's terrible. Weight cycling is bad for our health. People who are dieting often experience weight cycling, the repeated loss and regain of weight. So this is also known as yo-yo dieting, right? Where you go on a diet, you lose the weight, and then the weight comes back, and then you go on a diet and you lose the weight, and then the weight comes back. So then you go on a diet, it's yo-yo, up and down. Weight cycling is associated with increased all-cause mortality, mortality from cardiovascular disease, risk for heart attack, stroke, diabetes, high blood pressure, and suppressed immune function. Weight cycling is more commonly seen in people with larger bodies due to the societal expectations that they lose weight. And despite weight cycling's detrimental effects, it's often not considered a confounding factor in research that investigates the relationship between size and health. So there's no way to delineate between is being fat associated with these outcomes or is weight cycling associated with these outcomes because we're not studying the right thing. The studies tend to look for proof that fat is bad instead of looking at how do we treat fat people? What are the long-term effects of weight cycling and yo-yo dieting and starving your body? And this is why I say it's healthier to just stay fat. Sure, eat the rainbow, do some sit-ups, work on your core. I don't know, take a walk. You need about 4,400 steps a day to see cardiovascular improvement. Not 10K steps, 4,400 steps a day is all you need. You can have healthy behaviors without a focus on weight loss. You can have a healthy body without a focus on weight loss. And in fact, I would say that you actually can't have a healthy body while you are entrenched in diet culture and weight loss culture because you're always going to be striving for thinness at the cost of your own health because that's how society goes. Point number seven from this PDF is eating disorders are increasing and becoming normalized. Weight stigma is harmful to health and not controlled for in a research. When we focus on weight, we are not being trauma-informed. Higher weight is not causal to worse health outcomes, and focusing on weight ignores systemic injustice. It's a good one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and read you that one. Though lifestyle factors such as nutrition and exercise are important, it is essential to note the historical racism and injustices within our current food environment. As presented by Soul Fire Farm, the U.S. food system is built on stolen land using stolen labor from Black and Latinx indigenous people. Not only has this created a large-scale food apartheid and trauma for people indigenous to this land, it has caused a disconnection of indigenous people from their cultural practices and identities. So, wow, yes, that's a whole other conversation that I would love to have on here. Because, again, this like moralizing of healthy food, fresh food, you know, farm to table, eat organic, things like this. Those are impossible for people who are in food deserts, more, more accurately labeled as food apartheid, because some people have access and some people do not. And it is literally like a food and nutrition second class. Like there is simply no access to the healthy, good, moral foods that are up here at the top of this hierarchy based on racism and eugenics. The entire way that American society and a lot of the world looks at food and weight is super problematic and does not actually capture true health concerns. So this has been a rant about diet culture supported by the science. I encourage you to read the science. It will be in the show notes. And this is probably going to be all over my social medias because those are such good little factoids and I love them. Okay, so 
What are you going to do today? Eat the rainbow, drink some water, and hopefully have a nice snack without feeling guilty about it. There is still time to hop in and join Stay Fat in 2024, my Body Love 31 Day Challenge. Everyone who signs up in January will also be getting a free copy of the 31 Day Body Love Workbook that will be going out at the close of that program. So I love you. I hope that you have a great day, and I'll see you later. Bye. Da-da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da-da.